Well, good morning, everyone. C.S. Lewis, in his essay, The Weight of Glory, talks about an inconsolable secret, a longing that we experience during those moments of beauty. Uh, we experience uh, a perfect day, so it seems, and, and somewhere along the line during that day, there's this, this poignant ache, there's this longing for uh, something more. Uh, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe you have had the, the perfect Christmas day. Uh, I think for those who have kids, the perfect Christmas day is when the kids don't get the flu, but maybe you set the bar a little bit higher and, and you have a Christmas day where uh, you do get the white Christmas that you dreamed of and all the family is there. Your sister is there with her newborn and your brother is back from Afghanistan and Everyone is there, and there's just something about that day that, that's wonderful, and you love it, but at some point during that day, there, there's, this, there's this longing for something that you can't quite put your finger on and identify. And that's what Lewis talks about when he talks about this inconsolable secret, this longing. Last summer, my wife and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary by going to Alaska for the very first time in our lives. Uh, her sister and family have lived there longer than we've been married, but we've never been to Alaska, and it was uh, the trip of a lifetime. Uh, there was one particular day, I remember, where we were uh, on Prince William Sound, and we were on this glacier cruise looking at these amazing glaciers, and, and the beauty of that experience, and, and being with uh, people I loved and not having a care in the world, and it was, it was as close to a perfect day as you could imagine, and uh, we saw some beautiful sights. Uh, we, we saw and heard that the glaciers calving these chunks of, of ice uh, just tearing off and, and the roar as they uh, dropped into uh, the sea, and it was amazing. But I felt it that day. I, I felt that longing, and it wasn't just a longing for this to continue, but it, it awakened in me some sort of a, of a desire for, for something more. I'm sure you've experienced that. Maybe you'll go uh, downtown this spring to the Chicago Opera, Opera House and watch the sound of music and uh, maybe the, the right people will be there and it'll be a perfect day and, and you'll, you'll just be enthralled with that. But, but somewhere along the line, uh, that uh, moment of beauty uh, will awaken something in you or even the memory of that beauty. That is, you can go back and you can think about a Christmas long, long ago or a great experience, and, and that longing is awakened even by thinking back to it. No matter what it is, uh, there is a, a longing in those moments of beauty. And what C.S. Lewis says is that sometimes we mistake those moments, those uh, feelings of, of longing for the, the thing that we're longing for, for the very thing itself. And we confuse that and we turn those things into, into dumb idols, uh, things that can never really satisfy, but we look at that Christmas and think, oh, if we can just make the next Christmas perfect, we'll be happy. But the truth is, even if we had Christmas like that every day, there would still be that poignant ache in our lives, something that we're longing for, even when things are perfect. So what is it that we are longing for in, in those moments? Well, C.S. Lewis puts his finger on it in that essay, and he says what we are really longing for is, is something that, that we haven't experienced. He says we, we, in those moments, we have the scent of a flower that we've never touched, or we get the echo of a song that we've never heard before, but we know it's a song we want to sing or it is the news from a country that we have never visited. That is uh, the longing. This morning, I want to take you there. I want to take you to that country that you've never visited. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Revelation chapter 22 verses one through five. I wanna to talk to you this morning about the life at the end of your longing. Uh, this is what you're longing for. Revelation chapter 22, verses one through five is the final scene 
in the final episode of the Bible's grand story. The final episode begins in chapter 21, and there are three scenes in this final episode. These scenes all picture the new heaven and the new earth. In verses one through eight of Revelation chapter 21, the new heaven and the new earth is pictured as a bride, a bride who is beautifully dressed for her husband. And in this imagery, we get this picture of of the intimacy that we will have uh, when we experience life in the unfiltered presence of God, uh, the life of our dreams, life without all of the things that make it miserable. And then in the second scene, the new heaven and the new earth is, is pictured as, as the most holy place. You read this section, you notice that there are a lot of dimensions, and uh, that's confused a lot of readers of Revelation. You have to understand that these are not literal dimensions, they are theological dimensions. And when you uh, work with the measurement, you find out that what you're dealing with is a cube, And that cube would be the dimensions of the most holy place, of the holy of holies. Uh, This is then the very presence of God. This morning I want to look at the third scene in Revelation chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 5. Uh, To understand this scene, you have to understand a little bit about the language that we're dealing with. Uh, the reason that Revelation is so challenging to people is it's written in, in apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic language. Uh, it's a letter. Uh, that letter contains a prophecy, a challenge for the people of God, but that prophecy is communicated in apocalyptic. And when you're dealing with apocalyptic, I found it helpful to, to tell people to read it somewhat like you would read a political cartoon. Uh, The cartoon that you're going to see on the screen uh, behind me is one that ran a few years ago in in a newspaper. And and just think of uh, uh, John, how he might describe something like this. He might say, then I saw a great Christmas tree, a Christmas tree decked in tinsel with with red balls and gold balls. And, And under the tree, I looked again, and the angel showed me a gift a gift that was wrapped in gleaming white paper, and on that paper, on the top were the words peace, and on the side were the words peace, and on the other side were the words peace. And then I looked again, and I saw a red bow, and attached to that red bow was a message. And on that red bow, uh, the the message was to uh, all of goodwill. Now, when you see that cartoon, you don't think, oh, uh, there is a literal Christmas tree with a literal present underneath that, that contains peace in it. We don't think that way, do we? we? We understand how political cartoons work. And I think we have to make the same adjustment when we come to the book of Revelation and to say that, that what we read in 22, 1 to 5, like other parts of the book, is talking about something very real. It's talking about literal reality, but it's not doing it in a literal way. So as we look at 22, 1 to 5, we are looking at the life at the end of the longing. We're we're looking at at the thing itself. As C.S. Lewis says, there's this inconsolable longing for a country that we've never visited. Well, this is the country in chapter 22, 1 to 5, described to us not in literal terms, but in, in the symbolism of apocalyptic language. And I want you to look with me at this passage, and as we work our way through this, I want you to know, notice uh, four uh, ways in which this, this city, the new heaven and the earth, is described. First thing I notice as I look at this is the river of the water of life. Verse 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. I was born in West Branch, Michigan, not too far from uh, the Asable River. And I've been back many times, and, and there are some beautiful uh, spring creeks uh, flowing in uh, northern Michigan that are crystal clear. I lived in Montana for a number of years, and... Uh, I even got to fly fish some just gorgeous uh, spring creeks that are crystal clear. 
Uh, not quite uh, what we have in the Des Plaines River that's just uh, uh, about a mile or so from my house. Uh, once in a while, it, it runs uh, semi-clear. Most of the time, it's murky, but uh, this river is running crystal clear. Now, if you know anything about the book of Revelation, you know that, that to understand Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament part of the Bible. Uh, out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 of them contain... Uh, allusions, allusion with an A, uh, references to the Old Testament, and this is one of them. Picking up on imagery that you find back in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, but also Ezekiel chapter 47, uh, verses 1 through 11, and I'd like you to turn there briefly, keep your finger there in Revelation 22, and go back with me to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47, in this great temple vision of chapters uh, 40 through 48. And in Ezekiel 47, something interesting happens. Uh, Ezekiel is, is looking at the entrance to the temple and he sees water coming out from it. Uh, usually when we see that with, uh, uh, with one of our facilities, whether that's a, a building here on Trinity's campus or that's a church facility where we worship or maybe our own home, uh, we, we panic and think that's a terrible thing. There's some kind of a leak. But the temple hasn't sprung a leak. Uh, the, there's water flowing out from the temple, and it turns into a, a huge uh, river. I want to pick this up in, in verse 7. Uh, the angel takes Ezekiel to the bank of this river. Ezekiel says, when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, the Jordan Valley, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. If you've ever visited Israel, even if you haven't visited, but you've uh, done your work in a, in a Bible atlas, you know that there are no fish in the Dead Sea. Uh, the mineral content uh, makes it uh, uh, kind of a salty, soupy uh, uh, consistency, and there's no fish there. Uh, when I visited a few years ago, I drove up and down uh, the, the highway uh, right along that western bank, uh, right by En Gedi, and I never saw a fisherman, uh, no fisherman there. In fact, I bought a T-shirt. You, know, you have to do something touristy. That T-shirt uh, uh, said Med Sea, Red Sea, and Dead Sea, and uh, there were brightly colored fish for the first two seas, but the Dead Sea, there's an outline of a fish. No fish in the Dead Sea. Well, well this is a picture of, of God giving life to this land, to uh, this region. And that's the image that's being drawn on in Revelation chapter 22. John sees in this city that the river of the water of life, it's clear as crystal, it's flowing from the throne of God. Uh, from the Lamb down the middle of the street of the city. Notice a second image in verse 2. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. I mean, can you imagine living in a city where there is no curse? My son-in-law is a, an assistant high school basketball coach for Stevenson High School. Uh, last night, they, they won the, uh, uh, the, the championship for, uh, for their particular league, uh, for the North Suburban Conference. And uh, it was kind of interesting uh, going into the, the, the gym where they played at, at that game, uh, went through a, a metal detector and, and had to be uh, checked, and then uh, even at, at halftime in this particular place, uh, there, uh, I was going to go and uh, go out to the concession stand, but there were a couple of fights breaking out, and that's the world that we live in, isn't it? But John sees 
on each side of this river, this tree of life. And again, this is apocalyptic imagery. It's kind of mind-stretching, isn't it? How you can have a tree that's somehow on, on the side of, of each river, uh, each side of the river on each bank. Now, again, I think it goes back to Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 12, which says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. And that's the picture that John picks up in Revelation. Finally, the life that we've dreamed for, uh, life in in the presence of God, uh, life lived in a place where there is no more curse because the throne of God is there. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I love the hymn that we often sing at Christmas. It's part Christmas hymn, but... A lot of it is a really second coming hymn, and that's Isaac Watts' hymn, Joy to the World. And I love the lines in, in that hymn where we read that, that he comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is found. Uh, far as the curse is found. And that's the picture that we get here. Uh, this is a life uh, lived in a city in the very presence of God It's set up well for human flourishing. All of the things that make life miserable are gone. Uh, No longer will there be any curse. And finally, what Paul talked about in Romans 8.21 has happened. That one day creation will be freed from its bondage and brought into the glorious freedom in the children of God. At last, it's here. And the reason for that is the presence of God. Look at the next picture, the throne of God in verse 3. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Probably an allusion back to Aaron, back in uh, Exodus chapter 28. The one who would go into the holy of holies once a year, into the most holy place. Remember the words that he had stamped on on his garments, holy to the Lord. And now here we are, we are in the very presence of God. No no restrictions, no filters on that. We're in the presence of God. We will see him face to face. I love Richard Bauckham's remark about this. He says, to see God's face will be the heart of humanity's eternal joy and their eternal worship of God goes on to see there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun, for the Lord their God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Sometimes when people think about heaven, actually the new heaven and the new earth, they picture that as uh, riding around clouds for ever, I guess, uh, wearing white robes, playing harps. And what they've done is they've taken a few uh, apocalyptic images from Revelation and they've turned that into a picture that, uh, that, that quite frankly, sounds a, a bit boring to me, at least uh, after the first 10,000 years or so. But really, are we just going to uh, uh, float around on, on white clouds and play harps? Is, is heaven no more than a giant retirement home? Is it simply a a worship service? Don't get me wrong, I I love to uh, worship with God's people, but is is heaven going to be just one giant worship service? Well, when you look closely at this text and and other passages that speak about the new heaven and the new earth, you notice that that's not the case at all. Notice at the end of verse 3 that his servants will serve him and that word is used very specifically throughout scripture of the priests. And then down in verse 4, right at the end, and they will reign, they will rule forever and ever. So serving as priests, reigning as kings. Again, it takes us back to the very beginning, doesn't it, to the Garden of Eden. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, where of course the garden is identified in Genesis 2, but, but back to the beginning, And what you see is that God's creation of human beings in his image has so much to do with 
uh, with them serving as his representatives. So I read this and I realize, well, we're going to have something to do. We're going to have a job to do. Life in the new heaven and the new earth is going to be a life of beauty and intimacy and, and adventure. It's the life at the end of our longing. It is the life that we've always dreamed of. Friends, what keeps us going, what, what is awakened in, in, our, in our hearts every time we experience a moment of beauty on this earth is that longing for what's coming one day. And according to Revelation 22, 1 to 5, and according to uh, the, the whole uh, final episode beginning in chapter 21, verse 1, what we find is that God will one day restore his people to life in his glorious presence. That's the thing itself that C.S. Lewis is talking about when he says that those moments of, of beauty bring to us the scent of a flower that we've never touched, uh, the echo of a song or a tune that we've never heard, uh, the news from a country that we've never visited. This is it. This is the end of the story, although, as Lewis would say in his Chronicles of Narnia, it's, it's only, only the beginning of another chapter, another great story to be written. But how amazing is this, that God will one day restore his people to life in his glorious presence. That's where the story takes us. It's there from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22, isn't it? You know, I've often thought over the years as I've wrestled with how do I describe the story of the Bible to, uh, to, to people who say, well, what's the Bible all about? Well, what, what's the storyline of the Bible? And I'm convinced that the storyline of the Bible is this, that, that God is at work reestablishing the gift of his presence. Now, you might say, well, well, I've been taught, or I thought that it was a story of redemption. <clears throat> I would say, well, you're absolutely right. But let's just press that a little bit further. Uh, redemption from what? Well, redemption from sin, but redemption to what? <clears throat> redemption to life in the presence of God. That's what we were designed for. Uh, that's what Adam and Eve had in the garden and then three chapters into the story, sin wrecked everything, didn't it? And we became broken people and the world became broken. And yet throughout the story, you see God at work reestablishing his presence, don't you? Uh, you see that in the tabernacle. You see that in the temple. Uh, you see that in the incarnation where God himself comes in human flesh. John in his prologue in verse 14 says that the word tabernacled or tented among us using that temple imagery, we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, the, the one who's full of grace, full of truth. And then today, living in the new covenant age, what, what a privilege it is to live in this age, to have Christ in us, the hope of glory through the Spirit who indwells us. And so as you look around, you can say, well, you know, here, here's the temple. Here, here are the people of God. This is where God's presence is. And yet one day we will be in the unfiltered presence of God. Thank God that we can experience his presence already, but not yet. But that's the end of the story. Every time you have one of those moments in your life where it all seems to come together and it's an incredible moment of beauty, whether that's a wedding day or a graduation or a celebration with family or, or finally just one of those warm spring days where you can be outside and soak up some sunshine and actually uh, see something green instead of white and brown in the snow. There's gonna be that inconsolable longing Friends, this is what it's pointing you towards. It's pointing you towards this life. And as you read the book of Revelation, what you find out is that this longing is what gets us through what Eugene Peterson calls the unlovely middle of the story. 
Timothy series is all about celebrating pastoral ministry, and there's nothing that I, I love more than being a pastor. It is a wonderful privilege, but it's also a great burden at times, and sometimes it's hard. And it's hard because there are people involved, people like me. Even if nobody else was causing problems, I would cause myself enough for a lifetime because of sin in my life and in the world, even as one who's been redeemed. So how do we cope with the difficulty of pastoral ministry? How do we cope with life? Well, it's by keeping the end of the story in view. This is what really drives the perseverance that we're called to so often in the book of Revelation. That when we're persecuted, that when hard times come for us, that we persevere, that we don't give up because of the the wrath of, of Satan, the evil one. Now his rage we can endure. Why? Because we know how the story turns out. Throughout Revelation, there is a call for purity, both doctrinal purity, both moral purity. You see that even at the end of chapter 22. How are we able to do that? We're able to do that because we know the end of the story and so we don't give in to every whim, every, every false teaching that comes along that seems to, to promise a, a better life and maybe it will make life attractive for right now. But we don't give in because we know the end of the story. That God will one day restore his people to life in his glorious presence. And it's all rooted in the gospel, isn't it? When you read the book of Revelation, you see that. In chapter five, you see the lamb who was slain. And you realize that through his death that he purchased people for God from every tribe and language, nation, tongue, to be his people. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, Jesus, Accomplish salvation. Through him, God is at work on this rescue mission, restoring people to life in his presence. Oh, that's what I love about the end of the story. Let me encourage you in those dark times, in those difficult patches of life and ministry to come back to the end of the story to get perspective. And in those good times when life seems to be going well and you have a perfect day, and even in that perfect day you have one of those poignant aches, one of those moments where there's that longing for something that you just can't quite you know, get your finger on what it is. This is what it is. It's a longing for life in the unrestricted, unfiltered presence of God a number of years ago, there was a pastor's kid from Montana who came to the University of Chicago to do graduate work in English. He never left Chicago. He never left the University of Chicago, uh, finished his PhD there, became the William Rainey Harper Professor of English. And at 71, when he retired, he decided that he would write some stories about his time, his life back in Montana. The story that he's most known for is his story, A River Runs Through It. Norman McLean was that writer, and, and I'd like to read for you the final two paragraphs in his, in his short story. I think this is wonderful prose. Norman McLean says, Now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman, but I usually fish the big waters alone. I often do not start fishing until the cool of the evening. Then in the Arctic half-light of the canyon, all existence fades to a being with my soul and memories and the sounds of the river. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops, under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are my family members who are dead and gone. I am haunted by waters. 
You know what, that's the inconsolable longing that Lewis talks about, but as beautiful as that prose is, do you you see where it ends? It's really empty, isn't it? You know, all those times in in the rivers and the feelings they evoke about all that Norman McLean can come up with is that, uh, that somehow under the rocks are the words and the words are family members who are dead and gone. That's the best that he can do. As C.S. Lewis would say, that the problem is that, that the river is not the thing itself. Oh, I know that well. I've fished in those very rivers that McLean writes about. I lived in Montana for 20 years, and I fished in those rivers year-round. Yes, even in December and January, you can fish in, in those rivers some of the days. I've been in those rivers when the snow is falling in December. I've been there in, in, in the half light of dusk in July. And I've sensed that longing. I've, I've had some perfect days on, on the river, and yet even in those days, there, there's that ache, there's that haunting, there's that longing. You know what? In those moments, I, I just can't lay hold of that, of that flower that I'm smelling And I can't lay hold of, I can't hear that tune that that seems to echo in the beauty of that moment. And I certainly can't go to that country that I'm hearing news from, even in the beauty of that moment. No, Montana rivers are not the thing itself. The thing itself is the city where the river runs clear as crystal where there's life, where there's life in the unfiltered presence of God. Friends, let longing for that city, let longing for that country, let your longing for life in the new heaven and the new earth be what shapes your life and your ministry. Let's pray. Father, thank you that in your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you that we are able to experience that presence already. But not yet. Father, thank you that no matter what twists and turns and difficult circumstances we face in the middle of the story, that we have the hope of spending life in your glorious presence. Encourage us with that, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.